where do you want AI to go? What, what would make you happy? What is the objective here, the objective function for those of us who are building AI um, or trying to inform it from other fields? What, what would count as success? Where do you want to take it to? <laughs> but it's a trick. No, no, it's much more than that. Uh, whosoever be he worthy shall have the power. <laughs> Whatever, man, it's a trick. <laughs> 
Well, please be my guest. Come on. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, this is gonna be beautiful. Clint, you've had a tough week. We won't hold it against you if you can't get it up. <laughs> <laughs> you know I've seen this before, right? <laughs> I Researchers and artists around the world have been using StyleGAN 2 to do all kinds of interesting work. At NVIDIA, we've been pushing the frontier of using GANs to synthesize extremely realistic images. The catch is that you need to train them on extremely large quantities of data. So to tackle this challenge, we've invented a new approach for StyleGAN 2 that we call Adaptive Discriminator Augmentation, or ADA. This lets us reduce the number of training images by a factor of 10, a factor of 20 or more, while still getting great results. As a scientist, I want to push the scientific knowledge and principles of AI further and further. And the first thing is start with uh, some really uh, fundamental laws and principles of AI. I keep saying that I still feel our AI era is pre-Newtonian physics, that we are still studying phenomenology and uh, engineering, but there is going to be a moment or or set of moments where we're starting to understand the, the principles of intelligence. And that is the scientists in me wearing the hat of a, a citizen, I guess, and uh, directing Stanford's Human Center AI Institute. I want this to be a technology that can 
in an idealistic way, really better human conditions, right? It's so profound. Um, it's so horizontal. It's so, um, it has so much human and uh, societal impact. Um, it, it, it can be very, very bad and can be very, very good. So there, I, I would like to see a, a framework of this technology being developed and deployed in the most uh, uh, benevolent way. What comes to mind very often, so I, I hang out because of the family I'm born into with uh, people who work at, at state departments, who deal with international laws, military laws, etc. And there's a, there's, a, there's a big concern here with militarization of AI, right? Danny just mentioned uh, human decision making, humans in the loop, right? People are trying to negotiate uh, treaties, limiting, should we limit? Should there always be a human in the loop when we when we build dangerous um, machines, you know, killer robots, as well as is happening, as we all know in the, uh, in the defense world, and and as will uh, happen. So, what about the growing threats uh, of militarization of AI, which is ongoing, and what should we uh, should we do anything about it, or pessimistic, can we do anything about it, or is that just uh, is that a, a genie out of the box? I want the costs and the benefits of AI to be evenly distributed across society, both in the United States and globally. And I want the public to trust that that's what's being done. And I think that's impossible without changes to law. <laughs> Just impossible. Um, I like one of the sayings of Michael Rabin from uh, Harvard and Hebrew University. He said that it's great that uh, Computer science has not been around for 2,000 years, and we are at a stage where very, very important results occur in front of our eyes. And I also like a saying by uh, Alan Turing in his mind paper, where he said, we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. And as Fei Fei said, as scientists, I want AI to advance, but since AI is having an impact, as big as physics had in the 20th century, engineering had in the 20th century, all the ethical issues, all the biases, and all the social implications that Margaret and others, and here and Francesca, have been studying, they are key uh, as responsibility of our ourselves as scientists. And in terms of uh, technical, technically speaking, what we are trying to do is to conciliate traditions of AI so that we cannot see, and as you said, Gary, before you've been saying since the late 90s, we have to converge, we have to look for convergence. You cited Ian Lecun, you cited other prominent scientists today. We need a way of seeing that several techniques can contribute to this endeavor of making AI fairer, AI uh, less biased, and AI to make something very positive for us as humanity. We need. Uh, as scientists to see our fields in a very uh, human, humanistic way so that not only the technical stuff advances, but we also have to be guided by serious and by effective ethical principles, laws and norms, as Ryan said. It's hard to, to, do, to do that at the moment. We are at the beginning of uh, an AI Cambrian explosion, as several people mentioned here but we need to be very aware of the social, ethical, and global implications that AI has these days. We have to be concerned about the North-South the North -South divide, about the different cultures in order to regulate it properly. We cannot see it only from a single cultural perspective. So that's what I want to see uh, AI researchers doing. To be, they have to be concerned about the technical results, the outstanding results AI has been showing, but also we have to be to care about other people, about other peoples, other countries, and overall, and overall uh, for the global health of the planet. Thank you very much, and uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to everyone. Thank you, Gary and Vincent, for the brilliant debate you brought yeah. today, and for the tax scientists. I am reminded of the old African proverb that I'm sure you all know, which is it takes a village to raise a child. Clearly, it will take a village, um, as we've seen today, to raise an AI that is ethical, robust, and trustworthy.